Center. It's good to be together here today. Why don't we go ahead and take our hymnals. We'll turn to number 197, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. 197. We are glad you came out today. It's good to be together, isn't it? Good to be lifting up our hearts together in worship to the Lord and being able to open up his word and receive from him. His word has what we need, you know? It, it has the truth, it has the direction, it has the correction, it has everything that we need for life and godliness. So let's go ahead and commit this time to the Lord, shall we? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Fathers, we come before you now. We just come with open hearts and open minds, and our desire is to hear from you to be able to hear you speaking to our hearts and guiding us in the path that you want us to walk. Thank you for the truth that we find revealed in your word. And I just pray this morning that you will um, open up our hearts and speak clearly to us. And I pray that the clutter that would be in our minds from the week, we could lay aside and be able to focus on you and lift up our hearts in praise and worship to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, number 197. Why don't we go ahead and stand together as we sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
be seated. Joe, would you come up and share with us now as we turn to number 96, the love of God. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. And happy just before the day of Thanksgiving. Frederick Lehman was born in the Midwest in 1868. He pastored several churches in Indiana and Illinois in the early 1900s and later helped to start the Nazarene pub Publishing House. He wrote numerous poems and songs and also published several volumes of hymns. In 1900, while at a camp meeting in, in a Midwestern state, Pastor Lehman heard it evangelists quote the last stanza of the love of God, which had a profound effect on him. This stanza had been found penciled on the wall of a patient's room in an insane asylum following the patient's death. The words of this third verse had actually been written almost a thousand years ago in 1096 by Rabbi Meyer, the son of the cantor in a city in Germany. The third verse is actually part of a poem which emphasizes God's eternal love and concern for his chosen people. This Jewish poem called Hadumut in the Aramaic, Aramaic language has 90 lines included in it and it is still read today for Shabbat and the celebration of the festival of weeks and fall harvest. It is always read just before the Ten Commandments are recited. Frederick wrote the words of the first two stanzas and included them with this third verse in 1917. He then went on to publish the song in 1918. The love of God has been used in the past several decades by numerous gospel musicians and is currently included in many of the newer evangelical hymnals as a worthy congregational hymn. Pastor Lehman passed away quietly in Pasadena in 1953.
Thanksgiving is right around the corner. We have so much to be thankful for. You've blessed us with a wonderful country where we can worship in freedom. You've blessed us with family and friends, and especially we rejoice in Jesus that we can have a hope for eternity and that we can have peace and purpose in this life right now. Father, I pray that as we um, split up now and the kids go into their children's class that you would just anoint the teachers with your heart and your words for these little ones and that you would help them to raise them up to be the men and women you've created them to be and i pray now too that you would open up our hearts and minds in jesus name amen, amen. you may be seated well good morning welcome to the christian center good to see all your faces by the way why don't we go ahead and open our bulletins for this morning's announcements. Tomorrow night is this Thanksgiving dinner. You can tell people are excited about that already. People have been calling in, reserving spots, and there is still room. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Please sign up uh, today if you forgot to sign up. I think I'm talking to myself right now, actually. So um, if there's anybody else other than me that still needs to sign up, please sign up today so we know um, how many seats to set out and everything else. And we bought a lot of turkey, so we should be covered on that. The marriage and parenting uh, class or Bible study will be on the 3rd at 6 p.m. Come join uh, Steve and Marion as we look to strengthen our marriage and families Wednesday evenings and child care is provided. Also want to make note that uh, this week we will have the women's Bible study study in the morning that will be canceled, but they'll be helping set up, and the women's nighttime Bible study that will also be canceled, and then the Wednesday prayer meeting and Bible study is also canceled. That's why I brought it up, because the marriage and panning is two weeks from now. I know it doesn't, I'm not going in order, I'm sorry, but just wanted to mention that while I remembered. Okay, Celebration of Lights is going to be December 5th at 6 p.m. Have anybody been to the Celebration of Lights down at the Circle? Anybody? Okay, nine of us, good. Um, so hopefully all of us will raise our hand after this year. We have an awesome privilege. Celebration of Lights is the lighting of Christmas Circle. Now, literally, it's called Christmas Circle for the reason that it's Christmas Circle, and we get to put the Christmas in the Christmas Circle. So that's pretty awesome. So we're going to be setting up the nativity, lighting the lights, doing Christmas carols, and the whole deal on December 5th. And what I've been just thinking about is, you know, Jesus came to be the light of the world, and we have an opportunity as a fellowship to be the, those lights that are set upon a hill. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to have some food and fellowship after the event, and we are looking for people to bring cookies. We're shooting for about 300 cookies. Sounds like a lot. It does, doesn't it? But if 10 people 
made 30 cookies, that's not that bad, right? My wife makes 30 cookies all the time, and I eat about 15 of them, you know? So if we just got 10 people to get on board, we'd be good. So there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Um, you can see me for more questions about that. Also, we need people that would be interested in helping with serving the hot chocolate and cider and everything else to our community on December 5th at 6 p.m. And if you have any questions, you can see me more about that event. Also, uh, earlier in the week, we haven't picked a date yet. We're going to be uh, setting up lights. And if that's something that you love to do, which I know it's something that you love to do, untangle all the lights and set them up, um, we, we could use some help earlier in the week. On the 4th uh, of um, January, we're going to start the Equip One Foundations 8 a.m., a nine-week study to give you a solid foundation in the doctrines of the Christian faith, and there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer for that. An offering box is located in the back of the sanctuary for those who like to contribute to the furtherance of the Christian Center ministry, and we just want to thank you in advance for that. Why don't we go ahead and silence our cell phones? I'd like to invite parents to take their children to Sunday school. And why don't we go ahead and stand and greet one another?
don't we why don't we go ahead and remain standing? We'll turn to Matthew chapter 16 this morning. Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to start, we're going to back up a little bit into last week's study, and we're going to start from verse 13. We left off with Jesus and his disciples going from the area of the Sea of Galilee to Caesarea Philippi, which is right at the base of Mount Hermon, one of the sources of the Jordan River. And this area was scattered with pagan temples. I read from William Barclay's commentary last week about Caesarea Philippi, and I wanted to read some of that again. By Caesarea Philippi, there rose a great hill in which was a deep cavern and that cavern was said to be the birthplace of the great god Pan, the god of nature. So much was Caesarea Philippi identified with that god that its original name was Panius, and to this day the place is known as Banius. And one of the commentators I was reading said that this place was also known as the Gates of Hades. And that's a verse we're going to be looking at this morning, which would tie in interestingly with this. The legends, Barclay continues, of the gods of Greece gathered around Caesarea Philippi. So against this backdrop of the pagan temples, Jesus asked his disciples this important question, verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. As they're in the midst of the pagan temples, what's everybody saying about me? Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. 
They're saying that you're a good man. They're saying you're a great prophet. But then he makes it personal. What about you? Who do you say that I am? And this is a good question for all of us to ask. Because how we answer that question is really going to determine our eternity. Who is Jesus to you? Is he Lord? If he's just a good man, if he's just a great prophet, and he's not the savior that has come to the world to save you from your sin, then you're going to miss out on that. So for the unbeliever, it's crucial how you answer that question. Who is Jesus to you? But for the believer as well, how do we answer that question? Well, we say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Lord. Amen? If he's my Lord, then that makes me the servant of the Lord, right? Which means I need to revere him as Lord, which means I need to obey him and obey his word. And so again, as we answer that question, it reminds us our relationship with God and what we're to do. So who are men saying that I am? Well, you're a good man, you're a great prophet, but who do you say that I am? And it's here that Peter steps forward and he says, you're more than just a man. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, the word Christ is transliterated from the Greek. The Greek is Christos. It's the same as the Hebrew word Mashiach transliterated into English is Messiah. So Christ and Messiah, the same. It means the anointed one, like the kings and the priests of old that we read about in the Old Testament, where they would have the olive oil poured over them. They would be anointed for service. They would be empowered by God, oil emblematic of the Holy Spirit and the empowering of God upon them. You are the anointed one. You are the son. You are the son of the living God. Now, the Old Testament predicted the coming of the Messiah. There's over 300 prophecies concerning the coming of Jesus. And it it spoke not only of his coming, details of his life and ministry, but it also described who he would be. When Peter said, you're the anointed one, you're the one that's been prophesied would come to save us and deliver us. What the Old Testament was predicting Well, Isaiah 9, 6, for an example. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Who is this Messiah that's to come? He's to be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And it goes on to say he's going to rule forever. So when Peter steps forward, he's not saying, oh, you're a good man and you're a great prophet. He's saying, no, you're more than just a man. You are the Christ. You are the son, the definite article there, the son of the living God, not like sons of God. Like we'll read in the Bible, angels are referred to sometimes as sons of God, or we would refer to ourselves as as sons and daughters of God. But here it's the definite article. You are the son of the living God. In Philippians chapter 2, the the NIV, the New International Version, it says of Jesus, who being in very nature God, who being in very nature, that's his nature, that's who he is. My nature, our nature, we're human beings. Philippians chapter 2 is it speaks of Jesus, who being in very nature God, and then it goes on to say that he clothed himself in humanity. He assumed humanity. He became a man to come to this earth to suffer and die for you and for me, for our sins. So he is, he is the God man. That's who he is. And so Peter, as he steps forward, he says, you're more than just a man. You are the Christ the son of the living God. Another prophecy in the Old Testament, Micah chapter five, it tells us the birthplace of the Messiah. When the wise men came to Jerusalem seeking for him who was born king of the Jews, Herod the Great called the religious leaders and said, where's this Messiah to be born? And they said, Bethlehem. And they went back to Micah chapter five, verse two, which says, but you Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. So it predicts his birthplace, doesn't it? Then it goes on to say, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Whose goings forth or his origin, not Bethlehem. 
That's not when he began to exist. He's always existed. One commentator translates the word everlasting as beyond the vanishing point. When you think back into eternity past, you go back to the days of the patriarchs. You go back to the flood of Noah's day. You go back to the Garden of Eden. You go back before Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Where have you come? There's no universe. There's no earth. You've come to the vanishing point. Our minds can't think beyond that. He is beyond, past the vanishing point. He's always existed. When he came to this earth and he assumed humanity, when he clothed himself in humanity, that's in Bethlehem. And he came so that he could deliver us from our sins. So Peter said, you're more than just a man. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus, Jesus really commends him, doesn't he? How blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Simon was his birth name from the Hebrew Simeon. And, and Jesus changed his name to, well, in John chapter 1, he said, you shall be called Cephas, which is Aramaic. It's like Hebrew, which means rock. The Greek would be Peter. And so that's why he's referred to as Peter. But he, he said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar means son of. So his dad would have been Jonah. So my dad's name was John. So I would be Stephen Bar John. And uh, my son's name is Michael. So he would be Michael Bar Stephen. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the idea. Blessed are you, Simon and Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. No man has come and said, hey, Peter, this is who Jesus is. No, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father, who is in heaven... This is a spiritual revelation that God the Father gave to Peter. This is who Jesus is. Now, Peter's having a good day today, okay? He, he's hearing. He's hearing from God. He's being commended in front of all the other disciples. And you've got to think for just a moment, too. So we read through the Gospels. We read through the New Testament. Peter was like the main apostle, wasn't he? He's always mentioned first in the list of apostles, and we read about him. He's, he's the main guy. He, he's the first one that's mentioned when they mentioned the inner three, Peter, James, and John. So he's, he is a, a very important apostle, as we'll see here in just a moment. But he's having a good day because Jesus is pointing out, Peter, you're on the right track right here. You, know? you got it. You answered correctly. You know how it is when you're in a group and somebody asks a question? and expects an answer. It's not a rhetorical question, but expects an answer. We're all a little bit timid, like, oh, I don't want to, you know, say the wrong thing and get it wrong. But you know how it is when you step out and you say, well, this is the answer, and the, the speaker goes, you're right. Oh, you feel pretty good, don't you? Well, this is Peter, I think, right now. He's having a good day. He, he's hit the nail on the head. So blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, verse 18, and I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Wow, this is, this is quite a thing that Jesus is saying here. I say to you, at first he says, blessed are you, Simon, Barjona. But then as we get to verse 18, I also say to you that you are Peter. Again, Peter's name means rock. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? Did he mean that he was going to build his church on Peter? That Peter would be the leader of the first church. This is what the Roman Catholics believe, that Peter was the first pope, and his successors who followed him had the authority. And this is where the difference is when you're talking with someone who's a Roman Catholic, and they have uh, a different doctrine than, than you have, than a Protestant would have. You'd go, well, the Bible, you know, the Bible doesn't say that. The difference is this, the Roman Catholics coming back to this passage and Peter having the authority here, the church built upon him, him having the authority to bind and loose, him having the keys to the kingdom of heaven would say he can speak what they call ex cathedra, which means from the chair. And that means in an authoritative manner, new doctrine that is equal to the doctrine of scripture. 
So you just need to recognize that you have a different foundation that you're starting from when you're having a conversation with the Roman Catholic. That's the reason there's a difference there. Well, is this what Jesus meant? Did Jesus mean that he was building his church on Peter? Now, a couple of things about Peter. Uh, Peter, again, he's having a good day. You've heard from God the Father. In just a couple of verses, Jesus is going to rebuke him and call him Satan. So Peter isn't that solid of a foundation. In a couple of chapters, Peter's going to deny three times that he knows the Lord. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul, we find, rebuked Peter for withdrawing from the Gentiles and eating with Jews. And, and so, you know, is the church founded upon Peter? Well, let me ask you this. What then, if the church is not founded upon Peter, what or who is the church founded upon? There you go. See, that's one you can just shout with confidence, can't you? It's Jesus, the church. See, if there is no Jesus, think about this. There's no church, right? If we have no Jesus, we have no church because he came and he died for our sin so that we can be reconciled to God. And this is the basis for, for the church. It's, it's faith in Jesus Christ. So what's the scripture for that? 1 Corinthians 3.11, Paul said, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. Now, the apostles and the prophets, they also played a, a very important role in the birth of the church, a very important role. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, it says of the church, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So looking at it in this way, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And again, if you don't have that cornerstone, you have no building because that's what everything else is measured by. The apostles and prophets, though, they, they played a very foundational role in the beginning of the church, did they not? What are we reading right now? We're reading the book of Matthew. So God used the apostles and the prophets to communicate his word in the first century and to us in the 21st century. So yeah, they're very foundational, but Jesus, he's the foundation. Well, well, let's come back to this for a moment. I say to you that you are Peter, and again, his name means rock, and upon this rock I'll build my church. It's a play on words in the Greek. His name in Greek is, is Petros, and it's in the masculine gender when he says it here. I say to you that you are Petros, masculine gender, and on this Petra, feminine gender, I will build my church. Petros means a rock. Petra means bedrock. It means a huge, huge rock. So what is the, the Petra that he's referring to? Personally, and, and it seems like most Protestant commentators believe that it's the confession of Peter. Who do people say that I am? Oh, you're a good man. You're a great prophet. What about you? You are the Christ. You're more than just a man. You are the son of the living God. And it's on that confession, when you think about it, of who Jesus is, why I made the mention earlier, our destiny, our eternity is based on that. Again, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, the New International Version, it says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Peter's confession, you're more than just a man. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. His church is built on him, but we enter in through confessing who Jesus is, through receiving him as our Lord and Savior. So he said, I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, notice, I will build my church, Jesus said. Not I will build God's church. I will build my church. Who is he? Again, he in very nature is God. And he clothed himself in humanity, and he came to this earth for the purpose of redeeming you and me. So upon this, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In that culture especially, the gates are the place where the elders would be, where you would go if you had a problem that you had to have worked out. In, in our day, it would be like City Hall where you would go, where the officials of the town would be. So this is the place of authority. It's the place of power. The gates of Hades 
What is Hades? Hell? The grave, the equivalent of the Old Testament Sheol, the place where the departed spirits would go, the place of the dead, the gates, the power and authority of hell, the power and authority of death will not prevail against the church. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, it says, And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, Jesus became a man, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Death is not going to prevail. The power of hell will not prevail. Death will not prevail over Jesus' church. For when you die, when he dies, and he's going to tell them in a couple of verses that he is going to die, that's not going to be the end. That's really the beginning. That's the act that saves us. And because he lives, because he rose from the dead, we know that we're going to rise from the dead as well. And so the power of hell, the power of death, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that death has lost its sting. You know, when you think about it, when, when a person dies, the most horrific thing about death isn't, I don't think, the manner in which you die, but what's going to take place after you die, okay? If a person doesn't know Jesus. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, when this corruptible, this body, has put on incorruption, the resurrected body. And when this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Think about it. When you've got your resurrected body, you don't have to worry about death anymore. I mean, you're past that. It's over. You are in your body that you're going to live in forever. Ever. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, oh, grave. Where is your victory? Now check this out. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. The sting in death is not how we die. But it would be getting on the other side and going, ah, I still have my sin. That's the sting in death. And the strength of it. Well, who says I'm a sinner? The strength of sin is the law. God has said you're a sinner. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need Jesus as the savior of our souls, the one who died for our sin. And he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the gates of Hades are not going to prevail against the church. This is the first time the word church is used in the Bible, ecclesia. It means the called out ones, the ones who have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Verse 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And he's talking to Peter here. And, and again, Peter is an important apostle. And I think as those who are in Protestant churches, we need to be careful that we don't backlash against the, the, the spot, the, how the Catholic church has elevated Peter, maybe beyond what scripture would actually say. We need to be careful with that about, about Mary, the mother of Jesus, too. Uh, I mean, these were great people that God used, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Peter, the apostle of the Lord. What does it mean, the keys of the kingdom of heaven? It, it's given rise to, you know, stories or paintings where a person passes from this life, and, and he goes up, and he meets St. Peter at the gate, and there's Peter with the keys, and Peter, there with the authority to let him in, or sorry, you can't come into heaven. And that's how it's interpreted by many by those who would put Peter in the place of the first infallible pope, the first one, and then his successors falling in his footsteps. But what did he mean by this? With keys, you have the ability to do what? You have the ability to unlock and go through, to open up. Okay, so we'd still have that picture. When we think the kingdom of heaven, we're thinking heaven, right? Okay, the kingdom of heaven, we're thinking heaven. We think when we pass from this life. But do you remember when we were in chapter 13 and there were the parables of the kingdom? The kingdom of heaven is like a sower who went out and sowed seed, or the wheat and the tares, or the mustard seed, or the leaven, 
or the pearl of great price or the treasure that's hidden in the field. Remember as we looked at that, it, it spoke about Christendom or Christianity right now during this period of time from the birth of the church and until Jesus returns. So think about it. The kingdom of heaven is like Matthew 13. So it's like a sower that went out and began to sow seed and some fell by the wayside, rocky soil, some by the thorns, some into good soil. Do you remember the interpretation of that? The one that fell by the wayside represented those who had hard hearts. And the birds that came represented Satan that came in and, and ripped the truth away. What was the seed? It was the word of God. That's not a picture of heaven. Okay? You're not going to have Satan ripping people off in heaven. It's a picture of what's taking place down here. So the keys of the kingdom, I think rather than it being the keys for those who have died and then at the gate of heaven, rather it's keys for those who are living that he can open up the kingdom of heaven through preaching and telling them about the Christ, the son of the living God. Think about it for a minute. Acts chapter two, the birth of the church, the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples. Who's the one who went out and preached in front of thousands? It was Peter. Peter's the one who went out and preached. 3,000 people got saved that day in Jerusalem. They're there at the Feast of Pentecost. They're from all over the Roman Empire. Predominantly, I'm going I'm to assume that they're Jewish because they're at a Jewish fe feast. The birth of the church was mainly Jewish. So he opens up the kingdom of heaven, if you will, to the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans, half Jew, half Gentile, they hear the gospel. Who's sent up there? Peter and John. And again, he opens up the keys of the kingdom, has the keys and opens up the kingdom of heaven to the Samaritans, half Jew and half Gentile. And then in Acts chapter 10, it, it is Peter that God reveals this vision to of the unclean animals. And he says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And God is opening up the door to the Gentiles. And that's where Peter goes to the household of Cornelius and shares the gospel with them. So I think that's what he's referring to here. Peter, you're going to have a very important foundational role as I give you the ability to go forth with authority and share the gospel that's for Israel and for the entire world. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This was a very familiar phrase to the Jews for the rabbis often spoke of the binding and loosing. And the idea is this, forbidding or permitting. Whatever you forbid, whatever you permit. Now, in one sense, it kind of sounds like he has the authority to say, well, I'm going to allow you to do this, and, and, and I'm going to forbid you to do that. You get to be saved. You don't get to be saved. It's not what it's saying. He's the conduit. He's the conduit that God is using. It's God's will that's being accomplished on earth, not Peter's will being accomplished in heaven. I wanted to read from um, Wycliffe's commentary. By the proclamation of the gospel, announcement is made that acceptance brings loosing from sin's guilt and penalty, and rejection leaves the sinner bound for judgment. This is from Warren Wiersbe's commentary. The Greek verbs in Matthew 16, 19, and what we're focusing on is the binding and loosing here. The Greek verbs are most important. The expanded translation by Kenneth Wiest, a Greek scholar of Matthew 16, 19, says this. And whatever you bind on earth, that is forbid to be done, shall have been already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth or permit to be done shall have already been loosed in heaven. That's the tense of the Greek verse. In fact, in my New King James, the margin of the Bible says much the same thing. And I think it's the New American Standard that translates it much like Weiss translation here. Warren Wiersbe went on to say, Jesus did not say that God would obey what they did on earth, but that they should do on earth whatever God had already willed. The church does not get man's will done in heaven. It obeys God's will on earth. It said to Peter right here in Matthew 18, whatever you bind, whatever you loose, it's going to be said to all the apostles, all the disciples, as they go forth as conduits being used by God. Verse 20, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he is the Christ. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Oh, you're the Christ. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Don't let anybody know that. And I think the reason why is because his hour had not yet come. 
In John chapter 6, we find that the multitudes wanted to come and force him to become king. So he withdrew from them. There was a certain point in time where Jesus would be revealed as the king. Zechariah 9.9, as he comes from the Mount of Olives on a donkey, being proclaimed, proclaimed, your king is coming to you. From that time, verse 21, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. For Peter, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> he had just been commended by the Lord, and now he's called Satan. And you can see what's going on here. He's looking at it through a human lens. Hey, we're going to go up to Jerusalem, and you're going to let the religious leaders, the hypocrites, you're going to let them put you to death? You know, he's going to say this two more times. He's preparing his disciples for what's about to take place, that he is heading up to Jerusalem, and he is going to be abused by the religious leaders, and he will die. But as he said right here, he will be raised the third day. They got the first part and kind of just stumbled on it, and I think they just kind of blacked out after that and didn't get the, he's going to rise again on the third day. In fact, in Mark's gospel, as he said much the same thing, it says in Mark 9, 32, but they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. They didn't understand what he meant and they were afraid to ask him. What do you mean by that? That you're going to die and you're going to rise again from the dead? I mean, even the prophets, the Bible tells us, didn't understand as they prophesied of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. What does that mean? They're looking for someone to come like Jesus you are the Christ. You're the anointed of God. And redeem Israel at this time. Throw off the, the yoke of Rome and, and you are our king. What do you mean? You're going to suffer at the hands of these hypocrites and be put to death. And so a stumbling block for them. And so Peter, through human wisdom, is what it looks like here. Peter, who maybe thinks he's on a roll here, I hear from God, you know, and, and this shall never be. Far be it that this should take place. But he's looking at it through man's eyes because Jesus... His pathway was a pathway of suffering. And this was God's plan. Not man's plan, but God's plan, how it would take place. The pathway for the Christian is much the same. We follow in his footsteps. It says in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And we think about being a Christian, if you're thinking it's going to be good health and financial prosperity, you're, reading, you're not reading in the right book because it says that all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We're following in his footsteps. And God does I think his greatest, most intricate work through our sufferings in molding our character into the people he wants us to be. It's not the way we would plan it, right? But so often this is God's pathway as we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we have an example here. Peter shows us that we can hear from God and we can also hear from Satan. And we need to be discerning. We can be influenced by God and we can be influenced by Satan. And so constantly searching for that heavenly wisdom and not relying upon our own earthly human wisdom. So Jesus will go on to uh, expound upon the reality of suffering for the believer. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So if you want to go after Jesus, if you want to be a follower of his, take up your cross. That's the implement of execution in that day. What does that mean? Like he said, it means to deny yourself rather than me first. I need some me time. It's about me. It's God first. He's the Lord. 
I'm the servant of the Lord. And so it's denying yourself and following in his footsteps. His will be done, not my will, but his will be done in my life. And he goes on to say in verse 25, for who, whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What, what a dichotomy that is. And especially initially for, for the unbeliever. If you seek to save your life, no, I, don't, I want to do things my way. I don't want to become a Christian and, and have to do whatever God tells me. If you seek to live your life like that, you will lose it for eternity. But whoever loses his life for Jesus' sake, whoever comes to him and goes, no, I want you to be my Lord, then you've truly found it. I mean, that's the pathway into salvation. But for the believer as well, we can make those choices on a daily basis, can't we? I kind of want to do things my way. You know, I don't really want to pray about this because God might say no. You know, I want, to, I want to do this right here. When we do that, though, we miss out. We truly do. Satisfaction comes through giving up your own desires for God's. When you go, no, Lord, I want to do it your way. I mean, that's when we truly find satisfaction in our life because his way is always best, you know? But we're, we don't think that at first, do we? This is what I really wanted. So often it seems like the Lord gives us back so much more. You know, we think if we go, okay, all right, Lord, I'm gonna follow you. I'll go pack my one bag because I'm going into the mission field to be a missionary. We think life's gonna be a drudgery after that. But that's a lie from the devil. You know, when you give your life to the Lord, I mean, that's the best life you can live. We as a family have enjoyed in the past reading through Tim Tebow's life story. Tim Tebow, the college football player that went pro. I know he's not in the pros anymore, okay? This isn't a foolproof story here. But it was neat to read about how he gave his all to the Lord. And what did he do? He was a football player. This is such a great illustration for my kids, because it shows you that when you give your life to the Lord, it doesn't mean that you don't get to do anything fun. I mean, think about how God used him in that way because he was such a vocal uh, person for the gospel of Jesus and not just spreading the gospel to unbelievers, but very inspiring to believers. And from what I've read about him and seen, you know, when he was big, and, and we got to admit when he was with the Broncos, he was... He was doing pretty good. It was a soap opera, but he was doing pretty good, okay? Um, he would still go to the mission field. He would still go to the Philippines, where the orphanage was. That's what he did as a kid with his parents, and he preached the gospel to all the kids there. And because of who he had become, he was a tremendous draw for a lot of people. It was great publicity for the needy. In fact, the um, medical team that my wife was a missionary with, Cure, they partnered up with Tim Tebow and built a cure hospital there in the Philippines. So it's, it was cool what he could do by what? Putting God first and surrendering his life to the Lord. And so as we surrender our lives to the Lord, God has such a great plan for us. So it's that thing we think we're going to give up so much, but in reality, oh, he blesses us so much, doesn't he, as we commit our lives over to him. And, and when you think about it, really, what's the alternative? Verse 26, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And when you think about it, this is really the only path that makes any sense to go down, is to surrender your life to the Lord and continue to surrender your life over to the Lord. What profit if you gained everything? I mean, think about it. What is your dream from a human perspective? If I could be the, just the richest person, if I could be the most famous person, if I could be the most powerful, you know what? Whatever dream a person has, if you gain all of that but lose your own soul, what profit is that? Because eternity is a really long time. I've shared this story, I'm sure, before here at church about a um, Twilight Zone episode called uh, The Escape Clause. Years gone by when I saw this. But this man, he sold his soul to the devil. And the price, what he got from it, was immortality. So he thought, that's a good deal. I get to live forever. Yeah, I'll sell my soul to the devil. There was an escape clause in, in the contract that he signed. So anyway, his immortality, nothing's going to happen to him. And he goes out, throws himself in front of a subway train, 
lives through it, you know, goes through all of these things and living this life of excitement, but then it gets kind of boring because nothing can harm him. So he's sitting in his apartment with his wife. He goes, I know what I'll do. And he's in ragged clothes. I'll go up to the top of my apartment building, 14 stories high, and I'll jump off. And the wife says, you're crazy. Don't do that. So she's following him up there. And while she's trying to stop him, she slips and falls off the apartment building and dies. And he's standing there. He thinks, hmm, the electric chair. I could give the electric chair a try. And so he calls the police. Yeah, I just killed my wife. And so he goes on trial, long story short, he has a great attorney. And as the judge slams down the gavel, not the electric chair, but life in prison without the possibility of parole. So it ends with him behind bars. I've got immortality. I'm going to be here forever. And then he remembers the escape clause. And the escape clause is he could surrender his part of having immortality, to die right then. And so the devil shows up, and he has a heart attack, and he dies. And it's that twist at the end. It's such a great picture of how deceptive Satan is, how he seeks to deceive us away from the Lord. You know how strong temptations are? And we think, oh, this would fulfill me so much if I did that. And you do it, and then it's like bitterness inside. Because he's a liar. He's a deceiver. The best life that we can possibly live is a life that is surrendered over to Jesus. Amen? Amen. It's true. It says in verse 27, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will 